As soon as I went, he was sitting down in a chair, in a vest and a lungji, um, and he was drinking something which turned out to be whiskey. And as I went in there with my pistol, which would never have fired because it was so full of mud, having gone through very muddy water, uh, he said, what the hell are you doing here? I said, we are raiding your house. Usol and the gunmen were arrested. They all denied everything, but the following day the police dragged hundreds of automatic weapons from the lake beside his house. The police now began to investigate British officials with whom Usol had been friendly. A military intelligence officer had actually telephoned Usol during the assassination. Because of some fluke on the telephone radio service, the whole conversation came over in the mess on the radio when everybody was there for elevenses. So, so when half an hour later they knew that there'd been an, the, the assassinations had just taken place and that Usor was heavily under suspicion, there was somebody else under suspicion as well, and that was me. Um, but uh, that fortunately went away. But evidence did begin to emerge of serious connivance by other British Army officers. A month earlier, a large consignment of Bren guns, enough for a small army, had been stolen from the Rangoon Ordnance Depot. The guns were taken by means of a forged authorization note. Some weeks later, a hundred thousand rounds of ammunition were stolen. Many of these guns and bullets were later found near Usaw's house, apparently part of a planned seizure of power. A British Army officer, Captain David Vivian, attached to the Burma police, was eventually found to have arranged the arms theft. But the weapons that killed Aung San and the cabinet were different. These were supplied to Usaw by another serving British officer, Major Henry Young. Vivian and Young were convicted and jailed for their part in Usaw's conspiracy, though Young was later released on a technicality. But were these relatively junior army officers the only British involved? One of Aung San's closest surviving colleagues is Brigadier Cho Zaw. He defected to the Burmese Communist Party in the 1970s and is one of the current military regime's greatest enemies. He now lives in exile in China and isn't allowed to meet foreigners. So one day, I phoned him at his house. Can I ask you, who do you think killed Aung San? Yeah, who really killed Budo Aung San was British government. It was their plot. Why do you say that? Budo Aung San was the leader who could organize and unite the whole country. So they were afraid of whole Burma get united. And they supposed that they could handle Burma more easily if they removed Budo Aung San. In Britain, that view is given short shrift by most who were involved at the time. That, of course, was a complete um, misconception on the part of the Burmese. There was no feeling. The British didn't think that they'd done anything wrong at all. But there is now new evidence from one of the British police officers on the investigation that brings into question the accepted version of events. Carlisle Seppings remembers he was receiving information on other British officers' involvement, but he was restrained from questioning them by the chief of police. He said, look, I don't want you to go anywhere near or arrest any British officers. This has got too big for both you and me. And if you dig deeper, we are going to tread on some very important corns. Just five months after Aung San was killed, Winston Churchill made some damning remarks about him in the House of Commons during the debate on Burmese independence, a debate in which, incidentally, Churchill and the Conservatives opposed the granting of independence. It was an extraordinary comment, coming as it did so soon after Aung San's brutal murder. Churchill called him the traitor rebel leader of a quizzling army and said, I certainly did not expect to see U Aung San whose hands were dyed with British blood and loyal Burmese blood, marching up the steps of Buckingham Palace as the plenipotentiary of the Burmese government. Well, Winston Churchill didn't kill Aung San, though he clearly loathed him. But to find out who may have been pulling the strings back in London and why they so hated Aung San, 
we need to go back to the start of Aung San's turbulent political career. When Aung San came to study at Rangoon University in 1932, Burma had been fully conquered by Britain for not quite 50 years. The country was ruled as a province of the far larger imperial concern, India. But in 1935, in response to a rising tide of nationalism, London agreed to give Burma separate status. For many, like 20-year-old Aung San, it was not enough. I think the ambition of most university students at that time was to become members of the civil service or to become professionals. But my father belonged to this new generation who were more political and who thought in terms of independence for the country rather in, than in terms of just a comfortable career for themselves under the colonial government. While still a student, Aung San threw himself into anti-British politics. He joined the most radical nationalist grouping known as the Thakins. The Thakin organization was formed because in those days, British authorities like to be addressed as the kings, masters, by their uh, subordinates. So all these the king leaders claim that we are the masters of our country, so you are not masters. The Thakins led strikes and demonstrations all over Burma, but as World War II approached, they were still no closer to achieving independence. The outbreak of war in Europe offered new hope to the Thakins. When the war broke out, we Thakins decided not to cooperate with the British. Our slogan was, Britain's misfortune is Burma's opportunity. Aung San and the other leading Thakins immediately became Burma's most wanted men. Soon most of the Thakins were behind bars. So Aung San and a fellow activist decided to escape from Burma. They stowed away on a boat bound for China and hoped to get support for their wild plans of a war of independence from Mao Zedong's Communist Party. But fate was to deal a different hand. The Japanese had been interested in Burma for some time due to their war with China. The Chinese were getting vital supplies from the British and the Americans through the Burma Road, which started in Rangoon and cut through to the hills of Yunnan. From early 1940, the Japanese had placed a secret intelligence unit in Burma. It was called the Minami Kikan. The role of the Minami Kikan was to cut the Burma Road from Rangoon to Yunnan and to do this by supporting the Burmese independence movement. Aung San and his friend were duly picked up by Japanese agents after their ship docked and taken to Tokyo. There they planned an uprising against the British. The Japanese would support it, but first Aung San would have to find recruits for a secret army. Over the next few months, Japanese agents smuggled the recruits out of Rangoon Harbor, but it wasn't easy. The ships were guarded at the gangways by British military police. I realized if we could get past them, we'd be all right. We would start fights and commotions in the town. Then we would smuggle them one by one. In all, 30 Burmese Thakins were smuggled to the Japanese island of Hainan, where they were trained in strict secrecy. In Hainan, we learned basic military training. The Japanese trained us in three areas, combat and warfare, intelligence and administration. However, the plan to re-enter Burma secretly and organize an uprising against the British kept being postponed for fear of jeopardizing Japan's far wider plans for a war throughout Asia. All became clear on December 7th, 1941. After Pearl Harbor, the plans 